Uh, hi, my name's Barry. I'll explain a little bit really quickly about uh, what uh, I do. I worked for two companies. Uh, one was Streetline, which is a company which started in my mom's garage with two IKEA desks and a trial version of Photoshop. Uh, the other was Make Believe, a company we recently merged with to form a new company called Agency. We just decided on a brand yesterday, so this is a road test. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the critiques later would be great. Uh, we're a social enterprise. A social enterprise is one set up around a social goal using the skills of business, using the um, rapidity that business can have. Um, to actually attack some social problems of our time. We get to work with some incredible people. Um, these are some of our clients. Uh, we've just finished doing a big project with the Australian Labor Party. We do a lot with Fair Trade. Uh, Purpose is a movement starting organization in the, U in the US. Uh, Amnesty, World Vision, and GetUp, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Have you guys heard of GetUp? Okay, political activist uh, website, petitions, that kind of thing. But we co-share an office with GetUp. They're like our buddies. Uh, firstly, a disclosure statement. I didn't study design ever, uh, and I'm really unqualified as a result to tell you anything about design. Uh, I just kind of did it. I did it through school. I just kind of did it when I got out of uni with a science degree and had no idea what I was doing. I just kind of started charging people to make websites for them, and somehow people keep paid, kept paying me to do it. So I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, but I have like nine years of experience, uh, and hopefully that's worth something. I'm going to share a few lessons that I've learned from much greater people than myself who've actually studied design. So you can pull me up on anything like theory-wise. I just want to tell it a little bit like it is uh, in the area in which we work, which is particularly around political activism um, and social change, and so design in that kind of context. Here's what I learned, and this is kind of like by way of showing my cards as to where I stand on design. Uh, firstly, design is not art. I firmly believe that design is purpose-based and therefore it is a measurable thing. You can make a bit of art for, uh, which is incredibly beautiful with no audience and art is art in, its, in and of itself. Um, design is always in the context of a purpose. That's why we have briefs. That's why we have measurable outcomes. Um, and I'll come back to testing a lot today because testing is so important for uh, what we do in a rapidly uh, in a rapid communications world. Uh, it is a testable pursuit. If your design doesn't meet the brief, they can know that. Uh, your clients can know that, people you work for can know that, your creative directors can know that. And um, I think it's really important to know that that actually sets us apart from artists. Sometimes we implement art to do the work we do, um, but it is a testable pursuit. And before that makes you think this is the most boring universe to live in, where everything is testable, I think it actually fosters creativity, that empiricism, that drive to test your designs, to test your work, to see how they actually go in reality, can foster some real creativity. Uh, because you learn, you can learn quickly, and we'll come back to that. Um, a few things on red slides, because I thought like, that's an idea which I agree with. Uh, I used to do a bunch of work for MNC Saatchi uh, as a contractor uh, in their digital agency called Mark, who they shove in the basement of Sydney's most amazing building. Um, but the digital people, of course, they just pat down in a windowless office. Um, MNC Saatchi's whole thing is the brutal simplicity of thought. That's how they analyze every project that they take on, every advertising campaign. And I can't speak more highly of this as a concept. Um, it's a French guy whose name I forget says, uh, you've achieved perfection when, not when you've added all you can uh, to a design, but when you've taken everything away. That's when you've taken everything away possible and still retain the essential beauty, um, then you're finished. And I think that's very, obviously I'm a minimalist uh, in that regard, um, but I like more than one font, so I'm not religious about that. Uh, and the second thing from another agency which we do a bit of work with, everything does depend on audience. Everything is centered around the audience. If your brief doesn't mention who it's for, then who the heck are you designing for? I mean, you may be designing for the world, uh, which is a ridiculous brief. Um, <laughs> but you need to know who you're talking to or else it doesn't make any sense. Uh, these are some slides for a presentation I uh, had with a whole bunch of people starting up movements like Get Up in Ireland, South Africa, and if you think so, I've kind of jumbled a few presentations together. So hopefully this is helpful, and if not, you can just say the font was ridiculous. I can't believe Universe Extended wasn't used rather than just stretching the screen. Uh, design in activism. Uh, does activism make sense to people? Is that, is that a familiar term? Activism in the sense of political activism. I want to kind of narrow in on that. We do a bunch of work with 
uh, a number of other different organizations, some research, some fundraising, some social enterprises like fair trade, uh, ethical consumerism, but I just want to talk about activism today because I think it's particularly relevant. So political activism, getting up and saying something you believe politically. It's the only right you have guaranteed in this country by our laws, the right to political speech. Uh, would you believe that none of your other rights are protected uh, in legislation, only through common law? Crazy. But you have that right to free speech, and we work with people who exercise that far too often. And so we want to share a little bit about what it's like to work in a design environment uh, with people who do that for, to that for a living. Um, before, before we do any of that, I just wanted to, again, affirm the cigarette and say that such a change in that 27%, I think is really possible. Is it 27%? Yeah. Uh, there was this document which came out in the 60s called the First Things First Manifesto. It was a set of graphic designers, uh, commercial artists is what we used to be called, uh, a set of graphic designers who sat there and said, this is not a good use of our time. We are so sick of this. I love MNC Saatchi, I do, like I love their, I love their culture, I love the team, wonderful people. I just got so sick of like making ads for phones which Optus didn't like just wanted to sell because iPhones sold really well and we had to sell some other stuff. You spend your whole life designing for things which at the end of the day can seem completely ridiculous. These guys knew it in the 60s. They said we'd be bombarded with the work of those who have flogged their skill and imagination to sell such things as cat food, stomach powders, detergent, hair restore, striped toothpaste, after shave lotion, before shave lotion. They go on. And this manifesto was them saying, we are proposing a reversal of priorities in favor of the more useful and more lasting forms of communication. Design makes a massive impact on the world. And there have been people, and there still are people, convinced that your profession actually makes a huge contribution to the world around you. And that you don't have to sell out to uh, selling striped toothpaste over non-striped toothpaste uh, to work in advertising, to be in marketing, or to work in design. So, here's a question. Has design affected activism? Where would you go if you're going to look for political activism? You couldn't do a talk like this without mentioning Barack Obama. If you go to designingobama.com, they make this statement for the first time. A candidate used art and design to bring together the American people, capturing their voices in a visual way. For the first time, is the most ridiculous statement I think I've seen uh, on Obama. For the first time, design has been like an essential component of every type of activism for ages. This is Lincoln. In fact, this isn't even a Lincoln poster. This is a poster for McClellan, who was like pro-slavery and wanted to say how bad Lincoln is because he's going to give, um, quote unquote, you can read it there, Negro equality, more debt, harder times, the draft, and ultimate ruin. And notice how they're communicating. Incredible typefaces. Like, incredible use of focus when they do it. Uh, people would let it press the crap out of this today. Um, it's a beautiful example of design for some very unseemly ends, which is the proliferation of slavery, which thankfully McClellan didn't win. Everyone does this. Everyone uses design to do this. I mean, Hitler was insane with the strong symbology and uh, of incredible art. Uh, we see not just that people in political movements use design, uh, but design is greatly affected by them. Uh, this is a Russian Revolutionary poster, 1917. Uh, this is where I'm from. My crazy accent comes from Hong Kong. And um, in Hong Kong on the streets, and if you go to Shanghai on the streets as well, you can find some incredible examples of revolutionary art. That's kind of the extreme of political activism. And you see here, this is not uncommon for any kind of political context. Beautiful illustrations, painting these incredibly celebratory visions of the world of tomorrow, and some very clear poster-type letters. Uh, if my post on was any better, I'd be able to tell you what it said, but I can read about 200 characters, which is completely ridiculous. Um, but this fascinates me. These are the ones I love. Not necessarily these guys, who have hours and hours and hours behind them. But it's this, and these are everywhere. The pictures of Mao, which have been etched onto a woodcut in two colors only, because they couldn't afford more, and they couldn't afford the time to really finesse any of the works. These are incredible works, which are produced in an incredibly short period of time. And they became really symbolic of the revolution as it was happening. Um, Mao's Little Red Book, obviously they've chosen their palette well, they're limited to two colors. We'll talk about constraints as well and how that actually really limits us in our uh, ability as a designer, but could foster creativity. What I'm trying to say about this is not necessarily that everyone should follow Mao. Even the Chinese government now says Mao is only 60% right, 40% wrong. Well, 
Crown is politics. <laughs> what? Uh, what? Don't at all. Yeah. Uh, so what I want to say is that these influence design in huge ways. In huge ways. A whole lot of um, font styles have come out of the Russian Revolution. If you look at Obama's campaign, this was one of the fonts he trialed. Now, those font nerds of you will know that, yes, he did get a slab serif recut for this election. Uh, Gotham slab, unbelievable. But for a while, he was actually trialing this. Notice the sharp, blocky letters. A lot of this kind of like revolutionary style. Revolutions, political activism has created a style by which people can, um, people can actually um, connect with that. They connect with the revolutionary spirit. We have companies, these days, and corporates taking use of that political activism design and bringing it into their own kind of sphere. Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, he ditched this pretty quickly because everyone pointed out that actually uh, Cuba had a very similar typeface and a couple of their revolutionary materials and that was just not on. So what actually works? There's a guy called Gene Sharp who wrote the handbook um, for revolution. 160 ways, I think it is, to topple a government, to topple a dictatorship. Uh, he analyzes dictatorial situations. He's one of the few researchers out of the University of Massachusetts who does this. And he comes up with some interesting points. Um, in, incredibly interesting points around design and how important it is. Uh, firstly, the use of color, the use of a unifying color. I mean, we saw that with, with Chairman Mao, the little red book and the flags. This is the Ukrainian orange revolution. I don't know whether you guys uh, saw this maybe some 10 years ago now. Um, incredible revolutionary force in all orange. And maybe it's not a color, but a symbol. Uh, he says symbols are super important. The symbols you create, the symbols you use as a part of activism. Um, symbols can be really just as simple as a really beautifully set piece of type. This is potentially my favorite bit of art uh, design in activism, uh, is these simple placards. I am a man from the 1960s in the US in the civil rights movement. Um, and weirdly, you got some guy with a white guy with a beard walking around without a sign. I'm not quite sure what his point was, but um, there he is, looking like a hipster transported to 1960. <laughs> these form trends, these form styles, and we see them today. Uh, the civil rights movement today looks a lot like this. This is the Mill Million Hoodies March for Trayvon Martin. I don't know whether you guys saw that. Trayvon Martin uh, gets killed, uh, a young kid, a quarterback. Um, he gets killed uh, just completely out of the blue by some random vigilante um, for nothing. And people march in Washington and see the fonts, see the strong cuts, see the bevels on the serifs, all of those things harking back to that kind of disgruntled, revolutionary kind of feeling. Very simple communications and a very simple message. Um, so I want to say activism has actually changed design. It's, it's the other way around. Political activism has a huge influence over how we design here. Uh, so, I want to tell you a little bit of a guy called Shepard Ferry. You are wearing a Shepard Ferry t-shirt, the obey sign. Um, is, who's familiar with Shepard? Uh, you will all be familiar with his work. You can see, like, obviously the color palette, very kind of strong, bold, revolutionary. Um, he's an incredible graphic artist whose work uh, really came to prominence from this photo from the Associated Press, which he did not go to jail for uh, transforming into this. Uh, the Hope poster was huge uh, in the election. It really symbolized the Obama campaign. Obama went to um, potentially one of the best agencies in the world, got an incredible logo, had an incredible message, but it was an activist designer who really captured the spirit of the 2008 election. Um, and notice the constraints. A couple of colors, limited color palette. Uh, he's using, would you believe, Gotham? You wouldn't because currently his circle logo is an oval with this aspect ratio. Um, and you can even see he's using the kind of textures that we might see in a woodcut. He's really evoking that kind of revolutionary design style uh, just due to the limited number of uh, colors available. This, of course, sparked a whole crazy movement. You had Pope, you had uh, Hope, and you had Tony Abbott as well, uh, which is particularly shamefully done. <laughs> so it's a couple of inch, uh, like insights into like how design has worked. You guys will probably have much better ones than that. How design has actually been shaped by activism. Um, and I want to then turn it on its head now. What does it look like for activism to be shaped by design? How do you work as a designer in the sphere of political activism? And what does daily life look like? Um, this is our team. Uh, we cohabit. We share an office with GetUp. Um, we have accounts, uh, creative, web, and a random contractor on my desk. Uh, which is great. We're like a 10-person team. We're very small, but in this, there's about 30 other people who work for GetUp and other campaigning organizations. 
uh, and we come together at a place just down the road called the Campaignery. Uh, you might know it's change.org and avaz.org. There's some of the bigger international movements uh, who also kind of cohabit in our space um, there. It's an unbelievable privilege to be able to work with these people because they do political activism on a daily basis and they do it incredibly well. So first thing I want to say, like, what is it like working in a design, uh, as a designer in today's world? Uh, you know we change incredibly quickly. Uh, we do and we work with some big uh, organizations which really struggle to keep up and keep pace, like uh, World Vision International, 45,000 staff, 98 offices, it's going to be a tough beast to tame. Uh, at the same time, you have organizations like GetUp, who probably have more media coverage than World Vision um, multiple times, and yet there are 12 people on a good day. Uh, so how do they uh, do it? They're very nimble, they're very agile, and one of the main things they use is testing to do that. Um, have you guys heard of A-B testing? A-B testing is a concept with emails. When you sign up to an emailing list like GetUp or maybe even like Oxfam, uh, you might receive an email from them which has a subject line. And uh, one of the ways you can A-B test is to send one subject line out to one group of people. A subject line is like the subject in your email. Hey, how you doing? Um, or why you didn't clean up the kitchen if you're a passive aggressive housemate. Um, and you can then test them to say, how does this one go? Who, how many people open this one compared to how many people open the other? Uh, the Obama campaign was absolutely the kings of this. They had 50 people employed in the last campaign, 2012, just on data, just on data analysis. And they would test everything. We live in a world where you can know who's opened the email, what percentage, uh, what person they are, how many people have clicked as a result of opening that email. How does that fare against other states? How does that fare against other demographics? They can test absolutely everything. And so if you're a comms person, um, these are the kind of titles which actually did the best. Um, join us for dinner, question mark, uh, was one of the best polling. Um, they also tried many crazy things, like, have dinner with us, let's have dinner, dinner, question mark. Surprisingly, dinner, question mark, does a lot better than join us for dinner, question mark. Like, that's got a higher open rate, and they know that from testing. But by far, the best campaign email sent out by the Obama administration was, hey, in the subject line, which is the most annoying subject line you could ever write. But it tests incredibly well. Um, uh, Obama's campaign is a a really good um, John Stewart segment on uh, the Obama spam bot and how much email they're sending and how much they know about that stuff. But everything is tested. And it's not just true for the, for the copy you write or for the copy that communicators out there will write. It's true for the designs as well. Um, these guys, called Walk Free. Has anyone heard about Walk Free? Walk Free is an anti-slavery movement. There are 21 million slaves in our world today. You may not know that, but that's more than when we abolished slavery uh, way back with Wilberforce 150 years ago. Uh, these people work in forced labor conditions right around the world, and Walk Free is just one movement who's trying to fix that. Uh, they have 1.2 million likes after six months of getting started. They're a big, fast-growing organization. One of the reasons I think they work well is that they test, they test, they test. Um, we had someone from Work Free come in and just tell us a little bit about what kind of design style they think is polling well at the moment. Now remember, everything depends on audience. This is just what works with their 1.2 million people on Facebook. But they've got it down to a fine art now. They say, if you want to send out like a quote, you need a couple of elements to it. Um, these are kind of the shareable quotes on Facebook. You might see them and click like or share. Those kind of likes and shares, ridiculously important to the organizations which you're liking and sharing. So you see the guy on the left. It's a quote uh, in their official font by Kevin Bales, that's cool, with a Walkfree logo on a textured background. All of that stuff is heavily tested. They know that the things which get the most shares are quotes, inspiring quotes, on a textured background, and that seems to test really well for them. Um, the other, the difference between these two, you'll note this one got 1,900 likes, this one got 4,100 likes. Um, not just MLK, not just the fact that it was Martin Luther King, it's the fact that he's not white. They tested a lot of quotes and it turns out if you put a white guy on the image, it's not going to get as well liked as not putting a white guy on the image, putting someone else on the image. So potentially an image of like Nelson Mandela with some anti-slavery quote would be the most shared item among this audience. It's crazy the level to which we go when, it's, uh, when we test communications. But that matters because you, you care about the rally, you care about that message getting out there. And so you might have clients in the future come to you and say, hey, look, we really, we know these things from testing and you have to work within those constraints. They can be tough. Uh, there's also time constraints as well. That's, that's huge. Like if you're trying to be rapid and responsive, time matters. 
so, so much for our clients. Um, uh, time is uh, huge on the internet. Of course, like a meme gets out there and everyone is sharing that meme. You guys have seen these Hillary Clinton memes? Uh, pretty incredible. Hey Hill, what you doing? Running the world. It's basically just anyone and then Hillary Clinton in that shot on the cargo plane looking amazing. Going. It's Ryan Gosling meme. It's incredible. Uh, these things emerge so quickly. In the US presidential debate, um, Mitt Romney in debate number two said, oh yeah, like I really care about women in politics. Uh, yeah, you bet. Like when I was in Massachusetts, we had, um, you know, I, I realized there wasn't enough women uh, in federal, in state offices. And so, you know, I just, I just, I just said, you know, just go and get me binders full of women. And it's, it's ridiculous, right? It's a ridiculous problem. Binders full of women. Within 47 seconds, someone had registered bindersfullofwomen.com. Um, he's a friend of a friend. And it's this now, binders, it's ridiculous, right? What a ridiculous statement. Like, oh yeah, we need to increase the women in our workforce. Let's just get binders full of women. Um, and this is kind of keeping Romney to account on those kind of comments. Uh, actually, the incidence of uh, females in government positions in Massachusetts declined over his governorship of that state. Um, but this is how quickly polit uh, like political activism, for one, turns. There's a news story every day. Uh, you need to get out there. Uh, we're, at the moment, doing one f overnight for a job in New York, uh, which an international campaigning organization is doing at the moment. And we're just discussing whether we need to send a two-person camera crew down to Adelaide uh, tonight to film a story which is going to hit so an email can be sent out on Mother's Day. That's the kind of freneticism you have to live with if you're in campaigning. Um, a couple of examples of our work, uh, maybe these aren't potentially the most beautiful examples, but they do demonstrate rapidity. Um, GetUp wanted to make an ad. I'll show you the full ad, actually. Uh, it's Fun Hope for Mental Health. Uh, you might have uh, known that there was a huge uh, kind of push for an increase in mental health funding. Uh, especially when uh, Pat McGarry was the Australian of the Year a couple years back. Um, this ad was created in approximately three days, and on the first day, GetUp emailed their supporters and said, send us a photo. On the second day, we downloaded all the photos and we put it into an ad. On the third day, it was in the Sydney Morning Herald. That's the kind of turnaround times we have to deal with. Um, and those kind of time constraints really make you make quick decisions, like whether this in detail here was the best looking plane we could imagine or not, uh, probably not. Did we actually individually treat this and rotate it? Yes, did we do it on the inside? No, we didn't. Um, there were some constraints. We just like, I just don't have time to get this out. What is the woodcut option to stamp and get this, uh, get this online? Uh, this was an image we produced yesterday for Live Below the Line. Live Below the Line just uh, started their campaign today. Um, and I want to show you a little bit of detail here, because Jenny, an illustrator who works with us, uh, is great. This is simple, simple, simple stick figures. Um, uh, really, just beautifully illustrated by someone who has in the back of her mind the ability to um, draw a mountaineer in four clicks of a stylus, in four clicks of a stylus, to be able to draw a mountain goat um, in approximately 30 or 40 seconds. So this is a style which Jenny's kind of developed for these kind of quick fire political campaigns, just because you need to get these out for Facebook or you need to get them out for Twitter. Uh, this is one that was produced in two days uh, for GetUp, and it was hilarious because we put it in the Herald. And you see all of these comments on Facebook as well. And it was amazing. I, I thought it was a great moment because everyone's like, oh, yeah, great job in Photoshop, but this campaign sucks, blah, 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 blah. We're sitting there going, yes, great job in Photoshop. <laughs> uh, and it's not. It's a terrible job in Photoshop. Uh, this is like the worst blur tool I've ever used. Uh, it's like it completely blurs unusually around the edges. The rabbit has a halo um, underneath him. I don't know what's going on here. But you know, I could criticize this to death uh, if it wasn't done uh, in four hours and put in the paper that day. We have a good course of it. Oh, good. That's really great. Please help. Um, so my last rest slide that I want to share was like these constraints, these time constraints, these budget constraints, there almost certainly will be budget constraints, uh, not, not just in every job, but acutely if you want to work uh, for social change or in activism, there's not always the money around. Um, these things actually not only can, uh, can be really encouraging for creativity, they can actually define entire design styles in themselves. And I think it's actually a beautiful kind of intersection to work at. So, um, last thing I want to leave you on. In the 1960s, they wrote this document which said, put the first things first. You know, actually utilize your career for incredible things. And I'd say I never chose a career to design, I just kind of did it because I needed to eat. And I made websites because there was no other option. I tried to find the studios and no one would hire me uh, because I was terrible. 
Uh, I mean, basically, yes. Uh, that's it. And yet, for you guys, I think the world has changed a little. Web design is a lot more solid now, and there's more stable staffing around it. Um, and I think there's an emerging social entrepreneurs community. Social enterprise is growing. If you wanted to turn that 27% into a job for purpose, as a designer, those jobs exist. We are constantly hiring. If you can't get a job out there in the world in something which is going to be a huge change or just a generally amazing thing to do in the world as a designer, uh, I'll hire you just to prove you wrong. So that's my challenge to you. Uh, any questions? Thank you.